We're continuing on in this story in Exodus, uh, which is really exciting to be in Exodus, and it's such a powerful story. We've talked about that Exodus is a story that just keeps popping up throughout history. Um, it's referenced, it's talked about over and over and over again. In the Old Testament, they talk about um, Exodus many times. They'll refer back to it in the Psalms. The prophets will refer to the Exodus. Um, we, we get to the New Testament. Jesus and the, the writers of the New Testament, they, they talk about the Exodus. The early church referred to the Exodus. All throughout history, in, in the, the time of slavery here in America, when um, there were folks that were actively working to free uh, the enslaved folks all across the South, many of them were referred to as Moses because they were liberators of the people. We sing songs. Some of the songs we sing this morning have allusions to the Exodus. It keeps popping up time and time and time and time again. And that's because it's got power. It's one of those timeless stories that uh, we, we're just always uh, going to continue to talk about because it's so important and so powerful. So, this year, earlier this year, on January 6th, before this was pre-COVID, uh, which it's weird. I think we're going to be talking about pre-COVID and post-COVID for a long time. Um, but pre-COVID this year, which feels like a lifetime ago, um, I went away on a personal retreat. And I like to do these every now and then, uh, usually once a year, right at the beginning of the year. And it's really for my personal life, but also my work um, and, and just really spending some time alone to reflect and to think and to pray. And so I went to Aldersgate Camp, and I remember on January 6th, I was sitting in a cottage at a kitchen table at Aldersgate, and I was there by myself, and I was sat down at the table, and I wanted to reflect a little bit. So here's a couple of things that I thought about. First off, I reflected on my previous year, on 2019. I wanted to think about that year. What happened? Was it a hard year, an easy year? What did God do in my life? And then also... I wanted to spend some time reflecting on 2020, like on this year. Like, what was God leading me to? What were his hopes for me and my role as a pastor at this church? How did God want me to be as a husband at home? Um, my leadership in the community, what is God leading me to? And these are really important times. And so I sat down to reflect on 2019, and I got out my journal and here's the heading that I wrote. All right, this is what came to me as I described 2019. I said, reflections on 2019, hard as hell. Last year, I faced some significant challenges. Would any of you describe your 2019 in that way? Mine was pretty hard. And that's kind of how I chose to begin and so then I started writing and just writing bullet points and I refilled three pages with a long list of all the challenges I faced last year. And my list of challenges covered work life, uh, home life, everything. Um, it was just a hard year for me, a very hard year, 2019. I don't know if any of y'all can resonate with me. But after I finished writing about all of my challenges, I made a different list. And this list was a little more positive, all right? This list had the title, Lessons Learned in 2019. And I came up with 19 different lessons that I learned last year. And here's the thing, the interesting part. Every one of those 19 lessons that I learned last year were learned in the midst of struggle and challenge. I learned all my lessons in the midst of struggle and challenge. They weren't easy lessons to learn, but they're lessons I needed to learn. Y'all ever learn lessons through struggle and challenge? This is how I learned my lessons last year. For example, one of the lessons that I wrote down was this. The right path is usually not the easiest path. The right path is usually not the easiest path. So many times last year I faced a challenge, and, and when thinking and wrestling with how to respond to that challenge, I wanted to choose the easier path. I'm like, well, this would be the easier thing to do. Yet through some successes and also some failures, some courage, but also cowardice, <laughs> I learned through my experience that the easier path is more often than not the wrong path to take. It is not usually the right path to take. Usually doing the right thing is harder. So that's one of the lessons I learned. 2019 for me, 
I would describe it like this. It was a year of training. A year of training. Some years are more so like that than others, but it was a year for me of training, of discipleship. It was a year of learning and growing and changing. And even though it was a hard year for me, I do, looking back, I can see that it was a year of transformation. It was a year of deep change and growth. And and isn't that, y'all agree with me, isn't that how life often works? That through our struggles and through our challenges, we grow, we change, and we often become better, don't we? You know, God, sometimes I don't understand why we go through hard times. And I'm not going to try to answer that question. That's a big question. Um, That's that's the problem that people have been trying to answer for, for a long, long, long time, ever since the beginning of the world, really. But God does allow us, it seems, to go through many struggles. He allows us to go through tragedy and awful seasons, and people are feeling that so personal right now, even. And God... He allows so much of that to happen. I don't believe it's God's will always for bad things to happen. God is a God who wants goodness and and love and and grace and and flourishing. God doesn't want death and destruction and, 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 and awful stuff. However, there are times, though, I do believe that God intentionally will even lead us into a challenging situation. He did it to the disciples. Uh, They did it in Egypt with the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. God led them into some challenging places. And so sometimes I think God does intentionally lead us into challenging situations. And the challenges and the struggles that God leads us into or that just happen because there's a lot of bad stuff in the world, these challenges, these struggles are wonderful opportunities for us to be refined, for us to grow, and for us to change and to learn. You know, as we've moved into 2020, my training hasn't stopped. (laughs) My growth hasn't stopped because 2020 has proven to be more difficult than 2019 in many, many ways. However, I'm confident that even in the midst of the challenge, God is still training me and developing me and discipling me and shaping me into a better version of myself. You know, you think about how our bodies are created. Our bodies, our physical bodies can't grow and strengthen without pain and without struggle. Muscles, uh, the way muscles are formed is through tearing and breaking them down through exercise, through hard work. And then as they grow back and they repair, they grow back stronger. And I think the same is true for our whole person. We grow, we transform, we strengthen through struggle, through pain, and through challenge. The Israelites spent 40 years in the wilderness. Think about that. 40 years in the wilderness. Why did they spend so long in the wilderness? You know, I don't know the answer to that question, but I do wonder why. Why didn't God lead them through the Red Sea and take them right to the promised land? Instead, God led them around wandering throughout the desert for 40 years. Why did God do that? That was a hard season for them. You know, I I don't know God's intentions. I don't know God's motives. Um, But I have a hunch. (laughs) And I wonder, and I have a hunch, and my hunch is that maybe one of the big reasons that God had them spend 40 years in the wilderness is because they had a lot to learn about God. They had a lot to learn about their community. They had a lot to learn about themselves. You know, God didn't only set them free uh, from slavery. He did that. But God also was forming a community with a distinct identity, and they needed training. They had a lot to learn. And they they weren't going to learn all they needed to know uh, through hearing a message, uh, reading a book, (laughs) or listening to Moses teach them for hours and hours. And even Moses would give them instruction in the law, but often what happened is they needed to learn their important lessons through experience, right? They needed to train. Y'all probably know this, right? We often learn the best through experience, through trying things out, through practicing our faith. You know, we don't learn all of our faith through reading the Bible. We learn it through trying to live it out and practice it. And then we learn. 
And they needed that training. They needed to practice. They, they needed that training in the wilderness. And I imagine some of it was fun and lighthearted and enjoyable, but a lot of times it was really hard. Training in the dangerous desert is not easy. Our text from this morning is from Exodus 17, verses 1 through 7. And you can look it up whenever you want. You can pull it out now if you want. Um, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to highlight some parts of it. But this text that we're going to look at today and that the story was about today from the, the Christina film for us, this story is connected uh, to two other stories that came before it, actually. And they go together, really. And all three stories are about struggle and lack of resources. Have you ever lacked resources? Have you ever struggled? Well, these stories are about lacking some really important life-sustaining resources. So the Israelites community left the Red Sea, they crossed the Red Sea, they parted ways and, and with the, the, the past and they moved on and God led them to the desert of Shur. And in the desert, they struggled to find a very important resource. Can y'all guess what resource they struggled to find in the desert? It's a pretty obvious one. Uh, the desert is very dry and it doesn't have a lot of water. In the desert, they could not find this important life-sustaining resource of water. So for a few days, a couple days, they were traveling and they didn't have water. And they grew thirsty, very thirsty. Probably grew very dehydrated because they were walking and traveling. And they had very little water to sustain themselves. And so they got to a place called Mara. And they got to Mara, and Mara had water. And so they were probably really excited because they needed water. Three days with little water means you're getting close to dying, right? And so they arrived at Mara. They found water only to discover that the water was undrinkable. It was bitter, it said, contaminated. It was unsafe to drink. Imagine their frustration. They've been traveling. God had led them to this place. They found water and then they couldn't drink it. I mean, what on earth are you doing, God? They went to Moses, their leader, and they're like, come on, Moses, what's going on? They told Moses, we got to have some water. And so Moses went to God and God said, okay, Moses, here's what you're going to do. Pick up that log over there, throw the log into the water. And what happened is when the log hit the water, it did some crazy work with the water and it made the water drinkable. It was like, well, a huge like iodine tablet or something. I don't know. The crisis was averted. They could drink the water. But then God led them to another place, to the desert of sin. And there they grew hungry. They lacked another resource, food, because there's not a lot of water in the desert. And often it's hard to find food in the desert as well. So they grew very hungry and they complained to Moses. And, and so God came and showed up and showed out. He provided quail in the evenings and manna in the mornings. Christ is averted, right? We're good. But now we come to our story for today. God led them again to another place, continued through the desert of sin to a different location there in the desert. And naturally, again in the desert, they struggled to find water. Their water had run out. Maybe they packed up some water from Mara and they had run out of their supply. Keep in mind, the human body can survive for many days without food, probably two to three weeks. However, we can't survive very long at all without water, just a couple of days, two, three days without water. Our bodies are primarily made of water. We have to have water. It's interesting when you look on a water bottle and it has the nutrition facts for water. It's all zeros, no ingredients, nothing. And you're like, oh, water doesn't have anything in it. But water actually is so important for us. If you don't have water, you're going to die eventually. So the people were suffering from severe de dehydration. And so my question is this, that I want us to think about as we continue on, is why would God lead them to another place without water? What's God doing here? They had just gone to Mara. God provided water there, but now they're lacking water again. What is going on here? Why would God lead them to another spot without water? So keep that question in mind. So they're in this place. They go to Moses for help. He was their leader. Being a leader is very hard, just, to, just so you know. All right, Moses had a very big job as a leader. People expect a lot from their leader, you know. So they're like, Moses, where's the water? What's up? They argued with Moses about the water situation. They were furious with him. 
Some of them were calling, maybe calling for his head like, Moses, we, we don't need you as our leader anymore. They were dehydrated. They were suffering. They needed water again. Moses got angry with them. Um, and Moses went to God, and Moses went to God, and it's funny because he went to God not because his people were struggling. Moses went to God and complained to God that the people were mad at him, and they were going to try to stone him. Moses feared for his life in that moment. He was freaking out. And, and so then God told Moses, he's like, all right, Moses, here's what I'm going to do. He said, Moses, get your staff that you used when you put it in the Nile and turn the Nile into blood. Grab that staff. Um, get the elders of the community, go out in front of the people. Um, he, God said, I'm going to be before you on the mountain in front of you. And he said, I want you to go strike the rock at Horeb in front of all the people. And Moses dug deep, found the courage to do it, and he hit that rock. And sure enough, water flowed from the rock at Horeb and provided for the people. And then Moses gave the, the place two names, actually. He, one wasn't enough. He's like, he called it Masa and Meribah, which both one means to quarrel and one means to test. And, and it says, the narrator says, because the Israelite community quarreled with Moses and tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? Moses, their leader, uh, did not want them to forget that moment when they doubted God's presence among them in the desert. He wanted them to remember that every time they saw that place on the map, right? So back to my question, I'll throw on the screen one more time. Why would God lead them to another place without water? It's a good question. And like I said before, I can't claim to know God's intentions, but I do have another hunch here as well. Maybe God led them to another place without water because it was part of their training. It was part of their formation as the Israelite community. You see, they needed to unlearn the ways of Pharaoh, and they needed to learn the ways of Yahweh. For God is not like Pharaoh. Yahweh provides. Yahweh cares. Yahweh is good. And they needed to learn this. And so God was leading them into challenging situations so that they can learn from experience that God is good and that God provides. You see, turning from Egypt wasn't easy. It wasn't a good place, Egypt, but they understood Egypt. They knew what they were getting in Egypt. However, the wilderness was very unknown to them, even dangerous to them. But they learned through their experiences that God was in the wilderness, actually, promising them to provide. They had to depart Egypt and the ways of Pharaoh so they could enter into the wilderness, which is a place of life and freedom and love and provision and interdependence and cooperation. It was risky to leave behind what they knew, right? It was risky to enter into the unknown. It was risky to leave the unknown of Egypt and walk into the unknown wilderness. But over time, they learned that God was there in the wilderness. And God provided in the wilderness. And that life with God in this new community, even in the wilderness, was far greater than anything they had experienced before. Through their hunger, their heat exhaustion, their thirst, through their pain and their struggle, they learned to trust God more. They saw God meet their needs in dramatic and unexpected and very strange ways. And I wonder, maybe God was showing them that life under the rule of Yahweh was going to be very unexpected and peculiar. You know, as I pastor at Embrace and all the weird things we've experienced here at this church, sometimes living under God's reign is very peculiar and strange, but it is very good. You know, when they saw Moses throw the log into the water at Mara, and the water all of a sudden became drinkable, they probably thought, man, this Yahweh is a strange God, but he just gave us water when we needed it. That's pretty cool. When the quail randomly appeared in the ground at night and the freaky food manna appeared in the mornings, the Israelite community probably thought, this Yahweh is a weird God, but he's providing for us, so that's cool. When Moses took that staff and, and turned the Nile into blood and, and drew life-giving water from a lifeless rock, and hit that rock with that same staff, they probably thought, wow, 
this Yahweh is confusing, but he just brought life into a place of death. You know, what I want y'all to know this morning is despite all appearances, water does flow in the desert. Despite all appearances, water does flow in the desert. 2020, 2020 that we're in right now, we will remember this as a year of pain, struggle, heartache, setback. We're in the midst of it right now. It's been hard. It is a year of wilderness, a year of desert wandering for many of us. And despite all appearances, water does flow in 2020. God is still working in us. God is still working through us. The wilderness narrative in Exodus tells us that God is present in all situations and that God can provide in all situations. We, you know, we've departed, right, in this year, we've departed old ways of living. Things aren't the same. We've departed old ways of thinking that just aren't working anymore. We've left behind so much. Some of our beliefs and our ideas about God and the world are kind of crumbling. We've left behind so much. We've even left behind people that we've lost. Many people have lost loved ones through this virus and other reasons, through violence, through guns, through all sorts of things. But I I do believe that God can and God does make a way in the wilderness. There is water in the desert. These moments of time or moments and times of struggle I believe, can be part of our formation. They can be used by God to bring us closer to Him, to help us to learn to trust Him more, to rely on Him more, to trust that God is with us and that we can get through it. You know, there's one part of this scripture that I love and I want to share with you, um, verses 5 and 6. It says, go out in front of the people. This is God talking to Moses. Go out in front of the people. And what courage that must have taken. Go out in front of them all. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff in which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb, strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. This passage is interesting to me um, because God provided for the people in that moment, but he didn't do it alone. God didn't just come and make water start coming out of the ground. There was the rock. There was the staff. There was the courage of Moses. There were the elders there as witnesses standing there with Moses, supporting him and God's uh, deliverance. There was Yahweh's presence on the mountain. And all of these different components and pieces converge. And through them all, God provided. You know, God works in very mysterious ways. And who knows, maybe you are part of a larger puzzle and your courage or your vulnerability, your compassion, your activism, your prayers, your love, your handiwork, your service, whatever it is, maybe you are meant to be part of a larger puzzle that is going to bring life into places of death. You may not be the one holding the staff. Maybe you're one of the elders standing there as a witness. Who knows? But maybe God intends to partner with you to bring water to the desert. Or maybe, maybe you're going through a really hard time right now. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe you're in the wilderness. You're in the thick of it. Maybe you wonder like the Israelites, is the Lord among us or not? Well, this story teaches us that there is water in the desert that there is life in the midst of struggle, that God is with you as you travel through the wilderness. I'm telling you, even though you may not be able to see it right now, God is likely doing a work in you that is going to change you and transform you, that he's doing something in you. He's teaching you, training you, forming you. And through the struggle, you can become more like Jesus. And hopefully next year, in a couple years, a few months, you'll look back and say, man, God was doing something there in my life. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says something interesting in chapter 10. He talks about that rock that provided the water. And he says, that rock was actually Jesus. And now that's an interesting thing for him to point out. Uh, I don't know if he's literally saying, sometimes we, we read things way too literally. I don't know if he's literally saying that Jesus was in that rock thousands of years before. 
But I do know that Paul teaches us that Jesus is the one who provides for us, that Jesus nourishes us, that Jesus is our life force, that Jesus is, in fact, actually always present to us, and he promises that he will be with us to the very end of the age. You know, Jesus himself, out of his own mouth, said that he could give us living water that never runs dry. Jesus provides for us actually in a very special way beyond what the Israelites experienced in the wilderness. And Jesus is partnering with his followers right now to bring water to deserts all across our world. And as we follow his example of love and compassion, we join Jesus in his work to bring water to a thirsty world. My hope is that through this incredibly challenging season, we are learning a similar lesson to the Israelites in the wilderness. My hope is that we are learning to trust God more. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.